Here at the beach, there's signs saying where you can and cannot take a boat. There's all sorts of different uses here, whether it be swimming, boating, fishing, paddling, and a lot more. The idea of the signs and zones is to try and separate different incompatible uses with one another, and hopefully ensures everyone goes home safe. It's the same with roads. You'll find separation between trams, cars, bicycles and pedestrians. The radio spectrum is much the same. It's filled with diverse uses and different modes, not all compatible with one another. For this reason, the spectrum has been split up into different uses and different modes. <laughs> It goes back to the start of radio. When radio amateurs were accused of causing interference, they were relegated to wavelengths of 200 meters or down. That means above 1.5 megahertz, frequencies that back then were not thought very useful. Later on, in 1927, there was a World Radio Conference that came up with international agreements on the radio spectrum. That was necessary because radio signals did not respect national boundaries. That agreement forms the basis of amateur bands that we enjoy today. So if you'd like to talk to the, uh, the BX guys only... Oh, so, uh, I suppose watch this space. You need to know about these frequency allocations because they form the basis of your license conditions and you're tested on them, no matter what category of amateur license you hold. Here in Australia, you can find out about your license conditions on the ACMA website acma.gov.au There's a lot of other stuff underneath that that you're not tested on. You need to be aware of that so you avoid arguments on the air. Often known as band plans, gentlemen's agreements segment the amateur band into different modes so that CW may be at the bottom of the band, SSB near the top and somewhere in the middle digital modes. Again band plans vary a little bit between countries. The WIA website here in Australia lists all the band plans for all amateur bands. But note that ham radio is an international activity and you may hear signals on frequencies outside the WIA band plan. Don't worry, those overseas operators are operating legally. But you do have to understand the differences so that you don't get interfered with and you don't cause interference to people elsewhere. The band plan is a gentleman's agreement, i.e. you voluntarily follow it. Although you won't lose your license if you don't, you won't have much success because if you call CQ on a wrong frequency, then not many other people are likely to respond to you. You do need to use your common sense and that comes with experience. For instance, here in Victoria, there's a lot of AM activity on 160 metres on 1825 kilohertz. Now if you go and have a look at some of the international band plans, that's earmarked for the CW end of the band, and often for DX working. In practice, does that cause interference? The answer is no, because generally AM activity on 160 metres is during the middle of the day when the band is not open to DX. On the other hand, it would be somewhat unwise to fire up at night when the band is open to overseas. There's a bit of give and take, a bit of discretion, and no one causes anyone interference. There's a couple of other things to be aware of because practice on the amateur bands is different from CB. There's no designated emergency frequencies on the amateur band. However, if you do hear emergency traffic, then they have absolute priority. And secondly, on the HF bands below 28 MHz, there are no calling frequencies. If you want to contact, you find a clear spot, ask if it's in use, and go ahead and call CQ. On higher bands above 28 MHz, there are formal and informal calling frequencies. And the procedure there is you establish contact on them and then move to another frequency. Another thing is that on HF, there are no allocated channels. So there's no such thing as being off frequency, provided all stations are on the same one. We've spoken about the first two levels, what you must obey with as part of your license conditions and then gentlemen's agreements. There's a third level below that, 
and you can only learn about that through listening on the bands. And that is activity patterns. There's a lot of special interests in amateur radio and a lot of people from various special interests congregate on various frequencies. That's uh, quite pleasant this morning. Uh, we're getting the, the damp mornings at the moment, high humidity of the morning and then uh, turning off during the day. You find out about them by listening to bands, monitoring activity patterns and reading about various other special interests in amateur radio. Details of these frequencies are often published so that other summits of the air, national parks, QRPers, AMers and other special interest groups can find each other and have a focal point of their activity. However, that doesn't mean that if you're not in any of those groups, you can't use the frequency. The normal conventions of listening and asking if it's in use apply. So just to summarise, there's three levels of frequency allocation. There's what the regulations say, which depend on your own country's rules and your licence conditions. They are things that you must follow. Secondly, you've got gentlemen's agreements. They include band plans, but also frequencies for particular modes, or things to keep clear, like beacon frequencies. And finally, you've got frequencies that various local or special interest groups may use. They are more fluid than band plans, and they depend on activity at the time. They aren't in the same class as frequency allocations and gentlemen's agreements, but it's still worthwhile to be aware of them.